Hello, I'm Michelle Bird, Associate National Executive Director of the Producers Guild. On behalf of the Guild, I would like to again thank and acknowledge the companies that have made today's program possible. Our long-standing partner of this event is General Motors, an innovative company at the forefront of creating an all-electric future. GM has been working with producers behind the scenes and on screen since Hollywood's earliest days. We invite you to explore GM as a partner for your upcoming projects. Thank you, GM, for a decade of partnership with the PGA. Thank you to Green Slate. They've been instrumental in helping productions work during the pandemic. Their technology was all digital well before COVID, and they have the only all-in-one app for payroll and accounting. I know nearly half of the theatrical nominees are already using them. I encourage you to check them out too. Thank you to the Honolulu Film Office, one of the safest locations in the world. Skilled crews, stunning views, and tax credits make Honolulu the production center of the tropics. Thank you to Panavision and their post-production services company, Light Iron. From optics and cameras to final color, Panavision and Light Iron provide filmmakers all around the world with cutting edge end-to-end -to -end solutions to power their creative visions. Produce Iowa. If you're looking for an authentic experience paired with beautiful locations, Iowa is ready for your story. Thank you, Produce Iowa. This has been an amazing year for documentaries. For logistical reasons, we recorded this conversation a couple of weeks ago. Unfortunately, Craig Foster, producer of My Octopus Teacher, was in a remote location at the time and only able to participate during a separate recording. It's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Leslie Chilcott, an award-winning director and producer of seminal documentaries, including An Inconvenient Truth, Waiting for Superman, and most recently, Watson. Leslie? Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, this year, the annual PGA Meet the Nominees Breakfast is virtual, which is probably no surprise to anyone. Um, but I, first of all, would like to welcome each and every one of you, um, you all this year. I mean, every year we have great nominees, but the, the PGA kind of prides itself on having a very um, diverse list of nominees in terms of topic and scope. And I think you guys all represent that um, really well. So I'll just introduce you all very briefly and then um, we'll get to the questions. So in no particular order, we have Ramona Diaz as the producer and director of A Thousand Cuts. Um, we have Sam Soko, producer and director of Softy. Uh, we have Gregory Kershaw, who's producer and director of Truffle Hunters. Um, and we have Lauren Domino, the producer of Time. And we have Kristen Johnson, the producer, director, slash a million things of Dick Johnson is Dead. And um, we have Johnny Hughes, director, producer of David Attenborough, A Life on Our Planet. Um, and lastly, we have Craig Foster, the producer and subject of um, My Octopus Teacher. So um, thank you all so much for participating in this. And I think I'll start with Ramona Diaz, if that's okay. Um, question for you, Ramona. Um, a lot of your your films are always this very intensive, immersive style of filmmaking, which I find very brave. And I know that that takes a lot of planning um, and a lot of grit, but then your story can shift and things can happen, you know, that you don't always, you know, can't predict. So tell us um, why maybe for this particular story, A Thousand Cuts, why, um, from a produce, producerial standpoint, this was maybe even a little more difficult than usual? Um, hi, Leslie, and thank you. Thank you for this honor, um, a producer skill. I'm really happy to be here uh, to be a nominee. So thank you for that. Um, and thank you for this conversation. Up in my and I. Uh, uh, this one was even more difficult because we were following a very embattled uh, journalist who was being arrested 
Uh, she was arrested twice uh, when we um, when we were we started filming her, and she was also um, she was a target of uh, harassment both online and in real life. Um, and aside from that, we were also following um, uh, allies of the president uh, because uh, my original intention actually was to have a more um, ensemble cast in the film. You know, where it was very Robert Altmanesque is how I described it. All these people just interacting under Duterte's um, reign. But of course, as the story shifts and we, get, we gained access to Maria, you know, the center of gravity shifts in the film. And you should, as a documentary filmmaker, I'm really aware of the shifts in story and how I need to pivot, right? So it was just more difficult doing that because somehow sometimes I get very attached to this idea of this ensemble cast right but then when the story is right in front of you it's calling you and the documentary gods say this is your story um you have to listen to that and then really really shift um and this one was particularly difficult because we had sometimes two units in the ground sometimes three because we were flying all over the country trying to track all these people so it was tough too. And then it was, um, my biggest concern also was my local crew because I had a ticket out of there. My cinematographer had a ticket out of Manila, but um, it was a local crew and uh, and we had a very, I had a very, um, I had to have a very honest conversation with them saying it's becoming more dangerous and you can leave if you want without me ever. And no hard feelings, right? Uh, you, I will completely understand, but they all stayed um, because they felt it was the right story to tell, which was, which in itself, I'll always remember that conversation because it was so, uh, I don't know, it, it just melted my heart. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, but you don't think of it, I, I can't think of the danger, right? If, Mar if Maria Ress is going through it, who am I to, you know, I'm just making a film, of, I'm just making a film about her. So um, it's really every day, every day you have to think, can, can we work today? Can we work the next day? Get, you know, it, you, you can't really um, let the situation overwhelm you. It's an everyday thing. It's really working every day. Yeah, yeah. One of the things, one of the many things um, that I think you did particularly well was, you know, when you're with Maria, you don't want to leave her. But then when you go with the other women reporters and you start to get into their story, you don't want to leave them. And, you know, and then you, you're, you're leaving them and then you get to the next person and you're like, oh, but then that person is just as compelling and entertaining. So I, I, I think you maintain this ensemble spirit regardless. Um, so I think that was really wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. I mean, as you know, I mean, it's seldom talked about in documentaries, but there is such a thing as casting. You know, because after all, I mean, the, the medium requires it, right? The medium requires that the camera love the person in front of the lens because um, they have to have both a great story to tell and a way um, and a way where, you know, the uh, they, they have to be articulate about their inner life also and all that. So they have to they, ha they have to work at that level and yet have this real thing happening to them. It's, it's very mm -hmm. tough to find that sometimes. And then sometimes it just, it's right in front of you and you have to recognize it. Yeah, 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 that's a great answer. Um, Sam, I read that uh, Softy had, a, the story had a very interesting genesis, like that you actually set out to make an activist manual and somehow that, that turned into a film. Can, can you talk about that evolution? What? <laughs> um, yeah, just first, just thanks so much for nominating us. Um, you guys really don't know what this means for our industry because um, it's super young. And just all this just encourages so many people to that it's possible to, to you know, tell our stories. So the, softy, the genesis of Softy was not <laughs> in any sense supposed to be a feature film. And the more I think about it now, it just shows how nuts everything was to kind of get to this point because we just wanted to make a five minute video and put it on YouTube. That's what we wanted to do. So, um, and the, the main character Boniface was 
and is one of the most like flamboyant, notorious activists in Kenya. So in these kind of protests were like so out there in many ways. So when, when we were filming him, we were like maybe we would use those protests to become, you know, to kind of encourage other people who want to protest. So when that happened and then you started filming one protest and another protest and another protest, then you're like, okay, I'm kind of here a bit too long, but then you also kind of see <laughs> there's, um, we kind of had, we started seeing his life like with his family as well. And it kind of became important to, to present the story of the family as well, particularly his wife. So in that sense, what, what happened at that point for me again was, cause I'd, I'd gotten a little money to start off just for the manual. But then I kind of stretched it out into like two years. <laughs> and, then, and at that point I was stuck. Like you were like, okay, now you have all this stuff. Um, I want to go this way with the story and I have no money. And I, I just had to learn so much on the job in, in terms of um, putting together applications. Um, and you know how to take in rejection because if you've never done it before, you don't know how to take it in. So, <laughs> and, and have to deal with a certain perceived notion of how African stories are told um, in the sense of that, you know, this is an activist film. So we have to see the activist, um, you know, fighting the government in this way. So the kind of the family angle becomes kind of less and it, it kind of influences how you you pitch the film. But I, I think as a team also we became very lucky to meet partners who who kind of took a chance, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and them taking a chance, even in a very little way, kind of enabled us to think and be like, oh wow, this story can be something bigger, something greater. And it morphed and you know we I, you know the things you never planned for because i stayed there long enough for him to be like i want to run for office and i was like what the hell because because <laughs> you're already there for like three years and you're like i'm i'm, I'm done <laughs> but you know that's gonna be another year but that just changed everything like it be it just became a whole other thing and lo and behold, here we are. Yeah, yeah, that's a <clears throat> that's a great Genesis story. Although it's not really a Genesis story, it's a it's a keep going story. And I think, oh, excuse me, <clears throat> many of us in the documentary world, you know, our films have a way of never ending. Like they can go on and on and on. And I think you 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 were particularly deft at at, at adept at handling that because. You know, I've worked on campaigns before and it felt like as the film was forming itself, it, it, it felt like a real campaign. At the same time, it felt like an extremely personal story and like you literally had no idea where it was going to go. And I think that's a, that's a real um, achievement on your part. So um, congratulations there. Thank you. Um, Gregory or Greg Kershaw. Um, let's talk about Truffle Hunters. Um, I can't talk about it without being hungry, um, but you guys really entered a hidden world, um, a secret world to many, many people. And I understand that, you know, from things I've read and other things that you said that you spent a lot of time, like really earning the trust of this secret world, because, you know, we all want to find that secret story and share it with everybody, but these guys are competitive and they've built their life on their way of being and secrets and, and you know, and, and all of that. So how did you, um, how did you overcome that hurdle? Well, I guess, uh, you know, the film, when the film started, it really started by chance. My, my partner, Michael Dweck, um, who produced and directed and shot the film with me, we, we really, we, we stumbled upon this place and we, we had actually both been traveling in the same region and we were there really in the same little town and then right where we ended up filming within a week of each other. And we didn't know it at the time. And we were finishing another project 
um, back in New York City, and we realized that this incredible coincidence, and we were we were we were enchanted by this place. There was just this 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 part of Italy. There's something about it that it, to us it felt like a fairy tale, and and very soon after we both got on a plane together and we we explored. We started exploring, and we had heard that there was you know we had heard about these truffle hunters, this this culture, and we were told that it was old men that go out in the middle of the woods. It, with their dogs for 12 hours at a time in the, in the cold winter nights, searching for this, this ingredient, the white truffle, the, the most expensive and elusive ingredient in the world. And so we said, there's, there's, there's gotta be something there and it's gotta be, you know, that's the start of a story. And so we went back and we, well, at first we thought just meeting, we thought we could meet the truffle hunters. We thought we could meet these people that we had heard about who we realized, we quickly realized everything everything in this world is a secret, even the identities of the truffle hunters. So like we would go to a trattoria where they serve truffles on the menu every day and they get them from local truffle hunters. And we'd say, could, could you introduce us to the truffle hunter that you buy from? And he'd say, well, I, you know, I, I, I've never met the guy. I just put money in a box and I leave it there overnight. And the next morning, a truffle appears. Okay. <laughs> so we realized that it was going to take us, you know, it, we, even before we could meet the truffle hunters, we had to start building relationships within the community. It was kind of a situation where, we, you know, we would go to the trattoria owner and he would send us to the priest, he would send us to his cousin. And eventually we, we started, we started meeting the truffle hunters, but that took a long time. And then when we met them, I, you know, we, even before we brought out the camera, we just, we wanted to spend a lot of time with the people that we thought you might want to film with. We wanted to build relationships with them, and really, we wanted to build I guess, friendships with them. So, you know, there were there was there were months before the camera came out where we were just we would share meals with them. We would observe them in their daily lives. We would get a lot of coffee and a lot of wine. That's one of the one of the perks of, of shooting in this area. But we would we would we would observe their world, and and we would talk to them about why we were making this film, about what we thought was so special about this world, because to us. You know, it, it did feel like a fairy tale, and and we wanted it, it, this this place. It was it, it, there was a, a connection to nature, a connection to the local history, a connection to community that just it seems to be missing in so much of the world right now. And we wanted to figure out a way to capture that and to to create a, cin a cinematic language that a lot would allow us to 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 take that feeling and share it with the audience. And that was really, that was the goal of, of our production. And we, st we didn't have a story when we started. It was really just this desire to, to capture the feeling of this place in a cinematic form and, and share it with the audience. And, and the stories of the film, you know, we ended up, we thought when we first started the project, we thought it was going to be quick. We thought, you know, maybe, you know, a few months of filming. Of course, that's never how it goes. And, and the project ended up taking three years to film. And a, and a lot of that, was just because we, we we were we didn't have a story and we were we were following lives and the stories came out of the lives that we were following and it was only after spending a lot of time with people that I, that we started to get below the this the superficial layer of knowing somebody to really kind of understand what was happening in their lives and and to understand the web of relationships that that existed in the world around them and it was once we once we started understanding that, then the you know the stories that made the film ended up emerging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, from the moment your film starts, um, you really captured a new world. You're in it from the beginning. The cinematic language that you chose was just spectacular for the topic because right there you're like, I am in this old world, new world, you know, area where where craftsmanship and care, and it's it's all at the, the top most exquisite level. And then obviously you found such great characters too. So, um, so congratulations. Um, Thank you. Lauren, uh, I, Lauren Domino of Time, I want, I have so many questions for you. And so I, I tried to limit it, but um, Time is a very non-traditional story structure as the title suggests, which is part of its, you know, uh, brilliance, but it's, it's very, very authentic. What were the special challenges for you as a producer to, to carry out this vision of this non-linear time scenario that you and the director had? 
Yeah, well, first I want to say thank you so much for having us, and I want to shout out Garrett Bailey, who's producer and director of the film, and Juan Quinn, who's another producer of the film. And I mean, I think the big thing that was, wasn't so much but in the forefront of our heads is that Garrett really wanted to play with the notion of time and memory as you feel it in your body. So that even though you may be thinking about something from the past, it feels very present. So how do we create a world for viewers to come in that everything feels very present and current, even though we're dealing with the past? Um, so I think that that was a really big challenge for us and for with this film. And that's a challenge that came over time. Like this is a project that originally started conceptualized as a film. Um, and we're no like, pun oh, intended. no pun intended. We're like, oh, it's going to be a short about family and their lives, this fight to get Robert released and brought home. And, you know, towards the end of filming, Fox gave Garrett a bag of mini DV tapes. And it was all our little footage of her life and journal diaries and we're like oh once we had that gift we knew that the project became so much bigger also the relationship to time became so much bigger because we're dealing with them in the present but now we have all the footage to back up like where all of these emotions memories and longing comes from um so I would say it it was a challenge but it was also very much a gift um, yeah, that's a great way to say it. I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of nonlinear storytelling and, and you guys did that extremely well. So um, yeah, congratulations. Um, uh, Miss Johnson, uh, let's yes. talk about Dick Johnson is dead. Um, blending kind of fact with fiction is a, is a newer bag of tools for documentary filmmakers. Um, you know, uh, we all started out with the traditional, you know, verite, follow, immersive medium, and that is still fantastic. But I, I try and imagine the conversations that you were having with yourself over how you were going to film your father dying in various fictitious, you know, scenarios. Um, and I, I'm sure everyone's wondering, how did you dream up those specific scenarios? Uh, well, you know, it's such a, to be here with all of you, I'm in such admiration of um, all of the filmmakers and producers who are present here. And part of it comes from my long life as a camera person. And, you know, a camera person really understands what a producer is doing on a, like Lauren says, you know, on a visceral body level, you know, if a producer is um, bringing you to an extraordinary situation and giving you the tools and the time to stay, uh, you know, if a producer is feeding you and remembering to give you water, or if a producer has left you out in the sun for 12 hours, you know, so you have these really visceral body experiences in relation to ways that producers take care of you. Um, and allow you to do the work as a camera person. And so, you know, for me, um, in some ways you could say like imagining this film is built out of like these sort of decades of being crew and um, experiencing the unseen experiences that are in, that are sort of packed into films, right? And, and we all understand this is a collaborative medium. I think everyone in the Producers Guild would say on some level that they, have at times felt unseen in their work um, because it's not on the screen. You know, often it's the people we film who are on the screen or the subjects that we're focused on that are on the screen. And and I, one of the things that's like the most meaningful to me about my father is that my father sees me. He sees and recognizes me um, with such love and curiosity and compassion and pride. Um, and I, it's like what I started out in film trying to do is see other people. Um, but in fact, then I realized I had this sort of like group of people with me making films and that their labor was unseen. And, you know, so, so I started to think about the unseen in general and the things that are unseen that are hard to talk about. 
um, you know, the, the um, injustices that happen, the violence that happens, the racism that happens, the trauma that happens, it, it's hard to talk about. And, you know, it suddenly is like, it's hard to talk about death. It's hard to talk about um, our fear of death. And, you know, I'd done all of this work that was sort of facing head on in all different kinds of ways, the injustices of the world. And uh, it's very painful and hard and challenging and scary and risky, also inspiring. But there was a way in which I didn't, when I learned that my father had dementia after my mother had had dementia too, I was just like, I can't. Like, I just can't do it in the way I did it before. So there were all these principles that we brought to this work. It was like, can we see everyone on the team? So who is unseen here in this moment is Marilyn Ness, Katie Chevigny, Maureen Ryan, who all produced this film. Who is unseen here is also sort of, you know, all of the crew who worked on it, all the stunt people who risked their lives in films. Um, and what is unseen, what we can't see yet is death, you know, what's beyond, the way we're gonna die. Um, and all these sort of impossible unseen things, it was really fun to imagine how they might happen. Um, and that was the imagination in the film as opposed to the observation in the film. Um, and honestly, like I did have fun with my kids, with my dad, with the crew, with the producers, imagining how we might kill dad. But at a certain point, all of the rest of the producers were like, do we have to keep killing him? can't we do something a little nicer for him? And that's sort of how we were like, let's make him some chocolate cake. Let's take him to heaven. So it really was the producers pushing back on mine, like it has to be funny or else I will die. It was the producers like saying like, really, we've killed him enough. So, so I give great credit to the producers on this project for the process we created, but also for their like wish for like happier things for my father than death. Oh, that's really wonderful. And that, that's a that's a great way to talk about how much of a group effort, even though everyone's supporting the director's vision, that's that's a great way to talk about this. Um, I do have to share that the very first death um, was my favorite because <laughs> right from the beginning of the film, you're saying, I'm doing something completely different. And 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 you invite us into that world. I think that, that is really wonderful. Ah, uh, I'm glad. Uh, it's close to my heart too. I think it's because like, you know, we protect ourselves against what's painful and, and that like change up, like, uh Oh, I don't know if I can protect myself from this film is sort of where we were at. Yeah. Yeah. That's really great. Um, S Sir Johnny Hughes, I'm going to pass the <laughs> sir on, on to you. Um, you have a journalism background and I really enjoy discussions on whether or not documentaries are visual jour journalism, something more, something less, do the same rules apply. Um, but in this case, you had this urgent message about biodiversity and how we might be entering the sixth mass extinction. Yet you had this incredibly well-known person um, worldwide, maybe a little bit less here, but still really, really, really well-known, right? So how did you balance these massive concepts like mass extinction biodiversity with this massive personality while making sure that your, your message stayed front and center? Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I did use David a little bit like Kirsten used her dad, to be honest. Um, it, it's, um, and he agreed to that, you know, he was fully signed up to that. Um, and, and that's what I guess we've, a silverback we've got to be ever grateful for because uh he is unique um and you know he's so old he's 94 so he's been around nearly a century so he marks a century of humankind um and he's also i mean he's got an incredible broadcast career but he's never really vented and voiced his own opinions and that's because he's mr public service he spent his whole time working for the bbc until very recently um, and, you know, he said to me uh, that he could never say the things he wants to say in this film on the BBC because, um, you know, it's paid for by the UK public and, and he doesn't see himself as the kind of expert 
Um, so therefore, why would he give his opinion? But his opinion, because of his experience, he's seen it all. He's got that kind of Forrest Gumpness about him. He's been everywhere and he's kind of been there when all these things happen. Um, you know, it's really valuable, I think, in terms of documenting. And so, um, yeah, it, we, we, we got him in the right place and at the right time. And he was ready to sit down. I guess the challenge was to represent this guy in a way that is new and fresh because he's so exposed. And so um, the first time, it's not new to documentary makers, of course, but the first time I used the, um, the system we used um, in Terratron kind of thing, but much cheaper. Um, <laughs> we, uh, it was new to him, he'd never used it before. And um, it worked straight away because I think those familiar with David, they see him in two lights. One is where he's walking and talking and doing his expositions in, in his BBC series. And the other is where he's on some chat show kind of reclining a bit, being a raconteur. Um, and he's very serious in the former and he's very um, jovial and trivial in the latter, but you get to see a bit more of him and understand a bit more of him. So we wanted to break that down quite a lot and um, put him in front of a, a system where he sees me, not a lens, even though he's very familiar with the lens, he's very happy to talk to a lens, but he sees me instead. And then, um, you know, keep pushing. And we did um, a lot of, we did five days in the end um, with him looking at me down a lens and uh, went through the gamut. And, you know, quite often he'd, be, he'd say, well, is that important? And, and have we done this? But we kept going and he was really fantastic to allow this because yeah. we wanted to take various passes at things and we wanted to get to the moments where he felt a bit more exposed. And, um, and everything was, you know, this wasn't an, um, a film where we did that and then went away and, and made our own story. This was very much going to be his witness statement. So yeah. he was part of the construction of the story in the edit and signing everything off and then doing voiceover and things like that. So um, it was all with his blessing, which I think for this particular film was the right way to do it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. a bit of a juggle. And, and like you say, there's, there were really big, important things to say, but luckily his life spans the period that we needed to talk about. And he's been quite high profile for a while. So he, he had stories to say that were directly relevant. He had touch points with corals bleaching. Um, and the first time that people understood there was a thing called climate change. And, um, you know, he's got the, he's seen that change happening himself. So ideal yeah. vehicle really for that. And I think your vision comes across right from the beginning, just starting out in Chernobyl and seeing him in a slightly different way than, you know, we're used to seeing him over all these years. I think you hit the nail on the head and right from the beginning, you're like, okay, we're going to go into his world now, not just nature world, but his, his witness, his, his point of view. So um, I thought that that was really great. Um, Craig Foster, who is the producer and subject of my octopus teacher. Um, in documentary production, producers kind of have to be willing to go to the end of the earth for their film. Um, it's such a, a challenging medium. Um, in this film, you had to go the extra mile as producer and actually put yourself in the film, you know, as the subject and uh, be a part of, but also witness your interactions um, with your, your octopus. Um, being both producer and subject, I'm guessing, presented some unique challenges. Um, what was this like for you? It, it was very challenging uh, to be both the producer uh, and in this film. I hadn't intended to be in the film in the beginning. Um, <laughs> But our, our wonderful team uh, from three continents um, that put this film together, really a hive mind, if there ever was a collaborative process, this was it, um, persuaded me to, to be on, on camera um, and do this um, and you know, really express my vulnerability and, vulnerability and my story. Um, and uh, I guess when I realized uh, that I was really just a messenger for my incredible octopus teacher uh, and for this fantastic ecosystem, that was easier. That it was just 
I'd just be uh, the human voice for this, and it was easier. Um, but yeah, the the support I got from the two amazing directors, um, our incredible executive producers, um, and the unbelievable support um, from my family, and especially my wife, Swati, um, who, who's a, a, a very accomplished filmmaker herself and a great conservationist. Uh, she guided me through uh, all these years in, in the most beautiful way. Uh, so I had you know, tremendous support um, from the, the amazing film team and from um, my family and friends. So it was a, um, managed to get through okay. <laughs> Uh, one of the greatest gifts and challenges of documentary filmmaking is finding your story, having a plan, and then pivoting, you know, when the story evolves. Um, so we, we started to touch on this before, but I wanted to follow up because you had Maria as this incredible character to follow. You had this desire to make an ensemble piece. Um, and then you had a very timely story about... Uh, censorship of the press and um, ridiculing your enemies and that going viral and what is truth and we're in this post-truth era and I realize this question is getting very large but how did you make sure this particular story that you were filming in the Philippines um, translated globally did you consciously say to yourself if I if I follow this story it will automatically translate or are there things that I can do to make sure that everybody really gets that this affects them Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, so, uh, you know, when I f was first drawn back to the Philippines to make a film, um, it was really a film about Duterte. I had no idea particularly what it was going to be about, but, you know, I was born and raised in the Philippines and I was, you know, I was raised under martial law and dictatorship. So I felt like when Duterte became president in 2016, it was very regressive and I wanted to see what was going on. Um, and of course, the first thing was the drug war. So I thought, oh, maybe it was a drug war. Maybe I want to make that film. But that was breaking news when I got to the ground. And I can't, I don't know how to navigate breaking news. I mean, access is hard enough, but to fight other people for that story, I, I did quite know how to do that. So I, I looked around and there was Maria Ressa and Rappler, not only talking about impunity and the drug war, but they were also, Maria especially, was connecting it to disinformation and impunity and uh, the social media platforms and algorithms. She was talking about algorithms in 2016, you know, way before people were really uh, talking about it a lot. And to, just for me personally, it was like th this moment where like, I saw it all connect and then it became global. I knew like something, oh, this is a more global story. It's more, it has to be very, it's still specifically the Philippines because, you know, the specificity gives uh, the, the, the story it's sort of, contours right so it has to be that but then because she was talking about this information it sort of elevated it to this global story and I, I i knew it immediately and it was also new to me right and i always feel like if it's if it's this aha for me it must be an aha for the audience as well i don't know if that's you know <laughs> necessarily appropriate but that's how i think i'm like oh my gosh i want so so that's why i really pivoted to to Maria's story. Um, and then it went from there. And then, of course, when we were in, in editorial in, po in post production, we, we understood then it became very obvious that it was global and there were parallels to what was going on, especially in the US at that time. But we didn't really have to reach that far because it's organic to the story, right? We didn't even have to make that connection because it it just organically rose. That's what the story was about. I mean, I remember premiering when we, um, we were one of the lucky ones to have a real premiere last year at Sundance with an audience, imagine that live. Um, and people started coming up to me and saying, oh my gosh, there's so many parallels to this country. Then I realized, oh yeah, we did it. But it wasn't a very conscious thing because we, again, we didn't have to go that far. As long as we followed the, the thread, the, the, the like the truth of Maria, right? What she was going through, then it it, it resonated. Then it happened. Um, but also, I'm always aware that I have to make both a timely film and a timeless film, right? That it still has to matter 20 years from now. And I think that's uh, documentary filmmakers 
think of that because 20 years from now, you watch a film and it still matters. Not necessarily disinformation, but but the characters, right? Like yeah. the archetypes, like uh, the David David and Goliath story, uh, people speaking truth to power, fighting power. Um, so that was also, that's always um, foremost in my mind as well, both to be both timely and, and timeless. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Um, Sam, you did something similar with, with Softy. You took this, this local story and immediately it felt global, but you literally took a story about tribalism, not as a metaphor, but actual tribalism. And then it ended up being this huge metaphor for tribalism everywhere, whether that's like, you know, politics or, or, you know, whether or not you're, you're, you're an environmentalist or not an environmentalist or, or, or whatever it is, you really very deftly took this and made it count for everything. Did that, was that organic was, or was that conscious? Um, that was highly, I think just exactly as Ramona said, that was highly organic on so many levels. Um, I still say that at the core of this film, was meant for Kenyans, like, because this is my existence. This is where I grew up. This is what I experience every day. What you call tribalism for me is daily life. And, and it's, it's, you know, it's not, you know, just in a very simplistic way in Kenya, if you're, if you're dating someone and then you're meeting the parents, after they know your name, the next question they'd ask you is like, what's your tribe? And that kind of covers every knowledge they have of you they just don't any other information doesn't matter anymore and i think at in telling that story it it kind of um we 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 were able to express our existence and not only in tribalism but in also in our political situation in the sense in which we could tell the world that whatever you're experiencing we've probably seen it first. Um, like, you know, we, it's, it's in every, in every Kenyan and most African elections, it's the, the person who loses always says that, you know, this is, this was great. This is fake. This is, like that's every, and this is something we experience every day. And I think in going through that and sharing that, that kind of part of, of our lives and our stories, we found that there are a lot of synergies and engagements and there are very many places in which what we call tribalism is racism in the US. What we call tribalism is, you know, the caste, um, the caste system in many countries. And, and that, that kind of provides different spaces in which people would engage with our film and kind of see themselves in so many ways. And it to tell that story and to bring that story to the fore was very difficult like it was very complicated to to engage in in you know we needed like uh you know through say our our eps with i steel films like we edited with i steel films and co-edited with them as well um it enabled us to kind of find this synergy of both local and international like kind of like this is how the world views certain things but like this is where we're coming from and that in in my case it became important for me to co-edit the film to kind of give this perspective of like this is where we are coming from and was so lucky um in some of the custom was talking about the many unseen people whom you never see um like my the other producer um tony kamau is like she really helped to kind of ground the narrative and be like, you know, still Kenyans won't get this. Kenyans have to get, like, it kind of give you the balance so that when Kenyans watch it, they feel and learn something from it still. Like for them, it's not daily life. We're like, um, in many sense, yes, the film becomes timeless, but for the world as well, because of the work, us working with I Steel, it became important for, for that to, to work as well. And, you know, doing that, we, we, we started out with virtual edits long before COVID. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, 
Greg, uh, we talked a little bit before when we were talking about truffle hunters about this uh, strong cinematic language, um, strong in the in the most wonderful way um, that you that that you guys chose for truffle hunters, and it 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 really immersed you into this world. Um, however, when you went to the dogs. Um, I'm, I'm guessing there was some sort of GoPro rig. It was free and open and, and not constructed and wonderful. And that, that contrast was really brilliant. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, well, very early on in the process of making this film, we realized the dogs were, they were, they were characters in the film. They were, they were just as important as the human beings. Um, and we, we wanted to find a way to express the dogs perspective in the world and, and for the for the, the human perspective we tried to we tried to create a very deliberate painterly approach to to the way that we frame the film and the frames you know are we wanted each frame to to look like like a liquid painting and we wanted it to have um to have a a, a construction that that was that was our and our, our hope was to capture kind of the essence of the moment of how we were feeling the moment and, and perhaps how the characters were feeling it with the dogs, we, we we wanted to get in their head and we, we didn't really know how to do that at first. I mean, at first, well, we tried chasing them around with a camera and that was our first <laughs> attempt and that, that, was, that was not gonna happen. Um, and then we started experimenting with doing lots of research and different ways to, to, to put a, dog, a camera on a dog. And we found all these rigs on the internet and we talked to all these people around the world who had done it in different ways. And we came up with some really kind of like high tech options where it's like a little gimbal that went on a harness that went on a dog's back, but none of them, none of them like brought you into the dog's head. And that's what we needed to do. And, and we were trying to come up with a solution and um, we were staying in this little village in Italy. We had, we had like two stores beneath us. We had a, a butcher and we had a, a shoe cobbler. And we went down to the shoe cobbler and we kind of explained what we were trying to do. We wanted to create a harness that could go over the dog's head and would allow us to put a little GoPro on their head. And he said, sure, just give me the measurements, come back tomorrow and I'll have something for you. And, and we did, and he, and, and he had something for us the next day. And we went out with one of the truffle hunters, we went out with Sergio. And um, we said, you know, we just wanna, we wanna put this camera, this harness on, on Fiona's head and just go out truffle hunting and the cards last for hours. So just go out as long as it takes and, um, and you know, come back and we'll, we'll take a look at the footage. And, and he went out into the woods and it was in the middle of the night and Michael and I, my, my partner in the film, we were sitting in our, our, our production van that we drive all over and we waited for hours and hours. And, and eventually he came back and we said, uh, Sergio, where's, where's that camera with the harness? And he says, oh yeah, that, that, it, it fell off probably within the first hour. So we, we lost that camera, um, but we, um, we continued working with the cobbler and we eventually, we eventually had harnesses that fit on all the different dogs that we were filming with. And, and it was amazing because we, when we did get the footage back, I mean, the first thing it was just, it was kind of like, uh, it, it was a whole new way of looking at the world and you were brought into kind of the visceral thrill of the hunt. You were, it kind of felt like you were like on a speeder bike going through the woods and you saw, you started to see how the, the, the truffle dog interacted with its owner and you saw the, the excitement as they were digging up a truffle that kind of like that, that just frenzy of, 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 of uh, excitement as they're lured in by the scent. And it, 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 it it was uh, it was a whole new way of looking at the world, but then this this other beautiful thing happened is that we started to see how how the truffle dogs interacted with the truffle hunters in in ways that we could have never expected, and we saw that Aurelio, like one of the truffle hunters in the film, he he would talk to his dog Berba, and he it wasn't just commands; he would start telling Berba things about his life and his fears, and and it was so. Kind of bizarre looking at the footage too because she would be looking up at him and it, you could all, somehow in this weird kind of dog way kind of feel her understanding what he was saying so that you know it, that that insight provided us kind of just with a, a whole new way of understanding the relationship and, and it led us to to thinking about how we were going to film some of their actions with the, the human perspective also so there's there's films there, there's scenes in the film where you see Berba on the table eating with Aurelio. And we just, we realized that's, 
that's how they live. That's, that's how they share their meals. They have this incredibly deep connection that it's, I mean, it's a connection that's deeper than a lot of human beings have with other human beings. And, and this human and dog share that together. It was really, it was very beautiful for us to witness. Yeah. Really lovely, like literal and figurative new, new point of view. Um, I, that was really great. Um, Lauren, you had a, you guys had a really lovely choice with making time a black and white film, yet the story was anything but black and white. Um, can you, can you talk about that decision? Yeah. So for a very long time, we played with the film being in color. Um, and then, you know, going back to your first question, putting us in place of like nonlinear storytelling, it didn't really work because the footage, the color grade of VHS is just so totally different that you're like, oh wait, now I'm in the past and now I'm in the future, now I'm in the present. Um, so the decision to go black and white was to really create a seamless element that you can move through time, that you can feel time without having like color or the grade of the footage taking you out of the story and being like, oh, well now, I'm in the past, that it was like a river and flowing down the river through memory, through moments. Um, so that was very intentional. Like, how do we keep us in the body? How do we keep us present and fully engaged in this? Because as we experience memory, they feel, feel so present, right? Like Fox's longing of the past is informing everything that she's doing currently. Um, so we really wanted to be conscious of like, how do we make people not only visually follow this river, so feel it and black and white was really just the only, the only choice to do that. Yeah, yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Um, Kristen, you, uh, you know, a couple of the films that are nominated this year here at the PGA have their producers as either subjects on camera or kind of this ever present you know, very personal subject in the piece. Um, for you, uh, to the extent that it was even needed, I'd love to know your opinion if it was needed. Did you, did you have arguments with yourself about trying to maintain an objective lens, um, you know, pun, pun or no pun intended? But, you know, did, did you have that? Or did you say, look, this is a uniquely personal story. It's my story. So I don't really have to worry about objectivity. Um, well, you know, I mean, I, I'm so loving this conversation because everyone is speaking to the subject matter of cinematic language and, and how we have to search for it. You know, like Greg's talking about like searching to figure out like how to be in the position to understand the dog's worldview. You know, Lauren is talking about how do we, how do we enter into these decades of this family's life. Sam is saying, you know, we've been prevented from telling our story from our point of view in the past so that when we actually do it, people don't recognize it and say sort of what is it, you know, what is this new language? And in fact, it's the, it's the language of the experience of the thing. Mm -hmm. and, 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 it, and, and it is unfamiliar to us as viewers, right? And I think that's what we're all in some ways, like we have these tools of cinema language, but we, we sort of attempt to be other people for a long time to make films like other people. But in fact, once you get really to the work of it and you, you work with producers who support you, then you're searching to understand your own experiential language. And so it was really powerful for me, like in the shooting of the funeral scene, for example, Maureen Ryan um, helped me orchestrate, you know, we had multiple cameras, but we sort of delineated at what moments in the funeral was I only a daughter greeting my father's friends, not with a camera in my hand, but only a daughter um, and a long, you know, a friend of long term. But then that would end and they would go in and be seated in the funeral and then I could pick up a camera and be with my father um, and but then relinquish that directorial space and then become again um, just in my family. And there's a really beautiful moment. Um, I worked with Nadia Hallgren, who um, I've known for many years and, and I really trust her as a camera person. She was working on a camera up front, uh, but I had said to all the camera people, if there is a moment you feel you need to be somewhere else, go there. And 
so w at the end of the funeral, I'm standing with my father at the back of the church and I had the camera and suddenly Nadia is behind me and she just sort of gently like tapped me and she just took the camera from out of my hands. And she shot that incredible shot of my dad coming down the aisle at the end of the funeral, which allowed me to be in my family at that moment, not filming my family. I got to be in my family and filmed. And so all of this cinema language we built out of trust and back and forth, talking back and forth and understanding that my role in the film was constantly shifting. So the cinema language had to constantly shift. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I love that. Thank you. Um, Johnny, using uh, Sir David Attenborough's life as a way to show the decline in the natural world, because he literally is in his ninth decade, um, it, it, it seems like an obvious choice, but I don't think it was. I think it was extremely clever. Um, and, you know, what, what went into deciding on this as a construct? Because I think it put him in the position of being a mediator between this natural world that is declining and is quite frankly, a total disaster and you know how things used to be. So he was a mediator between his own story and this much larger story. Yeah, I mean, he, he was insistent from the beginning that he didn't want to express the idea that he knew all this stuff before anyone else did. He was very much just a lay person. I know he was busy and very high profile, but, you know, um, and perhaps at points got an early sight of things because of the circles he was working in, the work he was doing. But um, no, he's definitely just another guy, really. And what he was doing was, you know, it's the, it's largely his objectiveness, his love of the natural world, um, which has been there since he was a kid. And um, his interest that um, allowed him to formulate this story and have this kind of dawning awakening, I suppose, um, that was metaphorical of what everyone had on earth. So he's, he, he's, he's basically sta a stand-in for anyone who's lived through that same period. And I've lived through half of that period. And the dawning realization that what we're doing, you know, our lives on this planet are no longer compatible with the planet. That's effectively what's happening. And the, it's, it's pretty striking how long it's, it's, it's taken for all of us to become aware of this to the full extent that we now have become aware. It's taken us ages to get the idea. And that's partly because this change is happening so fast and it's an exponential change. So at first what, you know, even recently what were small warning signs are now, they're, they're loud, they're very, very obvious, everyone's getting it, you know, everyone's neighborhoods are on fire every summer, all of a sudden, because it's happening at an exponential pace. So we can kind of forgive ourselves actually. I think there's a lot of that in this film, it's supposed to be, um, listen, we can beat ourselves up, but there's no point to that. Instead, what we should be doing is saying, look, we get it now. And, and actually we're a long way down the track. We understand all the problems. We, we already have quite a good bearing on, on a lot of the solutions. So um, David is, is the human race. He's just in a single person. And his awakening over his lifetime is mimetic of the awakening of, of humankind. So yeah. in that way, yeah, he's, he's, our, he's our proxy, I suppose, for that much bigger story. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, Craig, with my octopus teacher, um, you know, people tend to anthropomorphize animals, which can be good or can be bad. There's a big debate in science um, now about how, you know, all the scientists uh, are taught with this rigor that you cannot put any human emotions onto an animal. Yet anyone who has a dog knows that, you know, some of the, or a cat even, that some of the emotions and some of the feelings there are very real. Um, 
But this can be especially challenging when, when, when filming an animal, how much to interfere or physically get in their way or not get in their way. So I'm curious, did you come up with a list of rules for yourself um, when interacting with your octopus? I didn't have a set of rules uh, as such. I just, um, I very much saw um, this incredible animal as my teacher not as a subject that I was looking at as a human and filming. She became my, my true teacher and I was um, there to learn from her uh, and I was in awe of, of that teaching. Um, and I purposely uh, didn't name her, although in the water, because one can't speak, um, you know, on land you, you start to naturally speak to animals that you're close to, but it doesn't happen in the water. So I didn't give her uh, a name as such, uh, like a, p a pet name. I didn't see her as a pet or a curiosity. I saw her as this extraordinary uh, animal that I had this privilege of being close to, and she let me into her secret life. Um, so that was really uh, the main the main aspect here is that it was it was a different sort of relationship to um, a, a human now uh, having a friend uh, as such it was more like a kin uh, a kinship but also a teaching and and arriving um, every day um, for that profound teaching um, well, according to my timer, we don't have time for my speed round. Um, you got your your answers were all just so um, perfect and explanatory, and um, I I thank you all, Kristen, Lauren, Johnny, Greg, Sam, Craig, and Ramona. Um, congratulations on your various masterpieces, and it's a real privilege to get to ask you these questions. So thank you. Thank you. You were amazing, you. Leslie. That was that was quite a challenge to span the globe like that. <laughs> <laughs> You're too kind. You guys um, uh, just I wish you I wish you all the best. And and not to sound like your grandmother, but you know you already won. Getting nominated is a win. <laughs> Finishing the damn film is a win. So oh, you no. you Finishing. Yeah. congratulations <laughs> um, to, and, to all of you. And I, yeah. I take like a screenshot. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's a okay. good idea. Can you share yeah. it, Sam? Yeah, okay. Let me do this nicely. Um, go. There we go. Yes, we heard yeah. the click. Yeah. You guys are all, you all really and amazing. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, it's such an honor to, to be in your presence. So thank, thank you so you. much. Mm. Likewise, you. Yeah. Likewise. Likewise, absolutely. Yeah, and good luck, everyone, as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and, and yeah, I, thank you. this is like the real stakes of all of our stories and the real stakes of this planet. Johnny, you really like today, I really felt it. I was like, okay, like we got to stop being in denial about all of it and find out like how we, how we like love and collaborate and build, you know, resistance to all of this. So, right on to all of you. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Such Thank an you honor to be so here. Much. With Such an honor. Thank you. Congratulations again, everyone. Thanks very Thank much. You. Thank you. Ciao. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.